So yeah, yeah Greg, you know, thanks for your time. I really, really appreciate it. You know, firstly, you know, you know, the fans back home on the island have been asking, you know, how are you doing and and how's life, you know, down south at, at Ipswich and you in terms of your recovery. Yeah, no, it's been um like obviously started off really, really positive, you know, nice for the change of scenery, you know, being in a club like Ipswich with a manager like Kieran McKenna and being at the top of the table has just been a phenomenal experience. You know, you 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 got a real clear plan going into games and really coming into the as the as the favourites, and that's been massive uh, and a real different uh, for me, but really positive. You know, I really enjoyed that. Um, I think that yeah, my injury is going really well. Like I'm ahead of schedule coming back. It was obviously just a really strange injury that happened, but it's uh it's really nice to to be around such sort of a good environment. And they've they've done everything they can to get me back faster. So luckily, yeah, like I said, I'm ahead of schedule at the moment. Um, hoping to be back maybe in like three weeks time back into training four weeks for games uh, so that's really positive but yeah being being down south is definitely different um, Ipswich itself is probably a little bit because I lived in Manchester when I was up north so a little bit of a slower pace of life but the weather's definitely better um, down here but the uh, the club as a whole has been a real change and I've really enjoyed the 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 feel of the club at Ipswich is a real family club, but also really trying to do things in the game and trying to, you know, get promoted. That's what we want to aim for. So that's that's a nice that's a nice uh, challenge and a nice aim for us. Yeah, yeah, just a bit on, well, before we go back up north, you know, at, at your club, you have the likes of Caden Jackson with Jamaican Heritage. And of course, um, Cameron Humphreys as well. I'm just curious if you had, ever had a chance to talk to them about Jamaica or any conversation at all about Jamaica, generally speaking. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I spoke with Caden. Um, about Jamaica, I spoke with Kyle Edwards as well, and I was saying, Caden was saying that he was he was obviously uh, he was speaking to Paul Hall actually just before obviously the change of management. Um, so it's something where I don't know if many people know of his heritage things like that, but it's something he'd definitely be interested in. Kyle as well, Kyle's come into the side recently and been doing really well. So I'm I'm not, I've spoken to them both at length about it about the trips and about um, the the squad as a whole. It's something they definitely both said they were interested in doing and coming and being part of. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, in terms of, you know, your family, not a people know this. Uh, could you confirm um, the former Athletics Association president of Jamaica, Warren Blake? He, is he your part of your family? Yeah, yeah. He's my uncle. He's my <laughs> uncle. Yeah. Right, a small world, I tell you. It's like in Jamaica, everyone's related to you, you know. <laughs> proper, proper. Yeah, for sure. Nice, the same spots okay. and with the same names. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So like you said, you know, you're raised in Manchester, born in Sale. Would you say growing up you were... A City fan, a United fan, Rochdale, Bury, Wigan. I was a, I was a United fan growing up, um, but I actually played for Man City for like 10, 11 years. So I kept that very quiet probably until about now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was a, it was definitely a split sort of thing because I was actually at City, uh, United when I was younger. I was, I was traveling at both. Um, but City were the team that kind of just, I saw my development being better there, even at a young age. So I was there when I was like 9, 10. Um, but yeah, I kept it quiet. But nah, it was uh, it was it was definitely something I just kept quiet for quite a few years. <laughs> yeah, and in terms of the experience that you had at City, how would you say it it sort of grown developed? Because you were there like before the 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 ownership from the Far East, and you know, with the ownership of the Far East, how would you say the club has grown and developed? You know, from the time that you were there, it was really interesting. I feel like you saw the change and how the money sort of was drip fed in, and then eventually it kind of blew up so to speak like um towards the back end of the, of the of things so towards like I'd say probably my my latter years you, you'd often sort of, it started off just a little bit like better here and there for I don't know facilities equipment you started moving to bigger places and then you'd start to see sort of the introduction of foreign players into the sides maybe about 15 16 a lot of players that like gone, have gone on to have very good careers as well you know like not at City but at different places so um, yeah, like, you know, I remember back in the day, like when we were under 15s, Adrian Rabio was with us. And then obviously people like Jason Benea, you know what I mean? He'd come in the fold, Marcus Lopez, uh, Dennis Suarez, all these, all these sort of Kareem Rakic, all these players, the Boyata, all these people who came through and sort of you played with them through the system. And, and I think that when they started really trying to recruit uh, and bring in the foreign players, it just became more and more difficult probably for the English players to get in um, but at the same time I think when they were still going through that development stage before Pep you had a chance to train and be around the best managers and worked under Patrick Vieira which was really good and I don't think with the, without the money and the facilities and all that whether he would have been as attracted to come and 
managers for order. So the experience you get from it was good. It was just more difficult to even be closer to the first team. And I know it's even more difficult now. So it was like, had its good positives and negatives, you know, but uh, overall, like it was a very interesting uh, project to see develop. In terms of the time that you had there developing from that academy days to the senior program, did you have that chance to mingle or, or, or be around Pellegrini when he was in charge? Yeah, yeah, that was the manager who took me. So I had a postseason tour and a preseason tour when I was with the first team, and he was the manager who took me there, um, which was good, man. It was a good, a very good experience. Yeah, for sure. Nice, nice. And of course, we know about the loan spells that you had at Crew, and you know went to Bradford later on. But you did something not a lot of players, you know, in England do, and that was go abroad. So what was that experience like going over to to Holland to play a bit of football? I was really eye opening. I think for like, first of all, for um, like I don't know, for like a lifestyle, you know, because when you go over, you learn a lot through sort of like learn a lot about life, but also for the football and it definitely taught me a lot. It was something I'd never, I'd never really considered. And then when the opportunity came, I was kind of just happy to, to sort of grab at it and see how it was going to go. I think playing football on the continent taught me a lot, uh, made me develop in certain areas that perhaps I was not lacking in, but definitely could have used improvement. And that helped me develop because there was all football, like total football there. So that was really interesting to see. And uh, and some of the players there as well, you should, like, like we were in the league watching them and you'd see them how, like not, a lot of them now come into uh to England to play because they've they've got real quality I found in uh, in the Dutch league. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a very interesting experience. And uh, it was actually sad I only did one year. I wish I could have done a bit longer, but it just didn't didn't quite work out for myself. Um, you know, a lot of you know regular boys such as yourself talk about sometimes that they've had in Scotland, like Kemar Roof and others. They say the first thing they mention is the cold, but I can sure the 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 crowd support something that was a bit passionate in Scotland as well. The fans, yeah, the fans are very very passionate and they're very <laughs> crazy. Especially Kem's fans, the fans at Rangers are crazy. Like I think that when when anyone goes up to Scotland, if you're not going to right uh, Celtic or Rangers, mm. when you're going to play. Yeah. A, against those sides, you know, when you're playing at uh at Parkhead and you're playing at Ibrox, like this, this, the sound, like the crowd noise is something that is just unbelievable. And obviously, you can play in front of that crowd every week is just something that's amazing. But yeah, I think that even playing at a, a place like Aberdeen, you know, you're talking twenty four thousand a week, and that was that was a different experience for me because I think that like we were playing that much in Holland and and well, probably not as much as that in Holland, but I think that. The fans are very passionate in Scotland. And also, I feel like they it's their Premier League. So, for them, it's everything. And uh, you, you get a good a good feel around the place when they're uh, in, like, big games and things like that. I enjoyed, I enjoyed Scotland a lot, actually. I did. Nice. Yeah, you know, in that time frame, you you got the privilege of, of representing Jamaica. I just wanted to know when you got that first call-up for the Saudi Arabia Games, was it a text message? Was it a, a phone call, an email? You know, that how did that call-up come about? It was an, it was an email. Um, because I think the first game got cancelled because of COVID. It was against Cat Catalonia, so Catalonia. Right. And um, I remember, yeah, I got the email because I was not sure whether my passport would come through, things like that. Uh, and I remember I was just, I knew the game was coming up. So I was just like refreshing my email, refreshing it, see if anything came through. And yeah, when I, when I got the, finally got the call, I was so excited, man. I was, yeah, I couldn't wait. I could not wait to get, to get there. It was, a, yeah, it was a proud moment. Yeah, and of course, you know, having yourself in the squad and uh, Ravel, Daniel Johnson, that second game in particular against Saudi Arabia, you saw how we played and you could see that something was building. You know what I mean? That second game that we won. Oh, a million percent. I think we even, because uh, uh, Leon was saying in the changing room, like when after the game, that was on a real togetherness, you know, and I think that he mentioned it again. Like, I think it was when we went for the third sort of, I think the final uh, qualifiers for the World Cup. So it was like when we, we played like Costa Rica, um, and El Salvador, I think, was the games. And yeah. Leon was saying the, the, the togetherness we felt during the Saudi Arabia game is something we needed to go back to because that was like the first time we really felt like, you know what, I think we actually ended up conceding as well first in that game. And it was just something where we're like, you know what, we're going to go out there, we're going to play, show what we can do. And we had that real belief in togetherness as a squad. Um, yeah, that feeling. And coming back off that trip, man, that was a, that was a real feeling, man. That was, that was, yeah, and it did feel like the start of something. And it's, it's been nice to sort of carry that on in parts, yeah. Yeah. And as you know, I can say, you know, amongst, you know, fans on the island, you know, who, after those two games, everyone was, was saying, where's Greg Lee? Where's Greg Lee? Until that game against America at home where we had fans back for the first time since COVID, mm, you know? So yeah. 
would you say <clears throat> can you say that it definitely was injury why you know you weren't in that frame for a little over a year basically yeah yeah i uh, literally so i'm trying to think i came back from uh being away uh i came back from being away and i got injured in the december so i think the trip was in the november i got injured in the december and then very badly injured in the february like the early feb it literally took me out until the gold cup and then in the gold cup i was like just fit but i think the manager had sort of said you know you, you haven't played any games or done any training like i was i was desperate to go but they were like it's probably safer for yourself and i was like fair like it, it, you know i probably wouldn't have been much use anyway with not being you know match fit or even ready to play without injury so and then i got <laughs> i actually got injured again i think in the uh september and obviously these injuries were just like quite unlucky they were very strange so i think that from then on i kind of haven't really had anything for the whole year and then i think obviously just the yeah, idea of the injury was just another one that was very random but i'm hoping if i can put this one behind me that will be that will be me i can kick right on because at the moment uh i'm still feeling good even though obviously just with a uh, sort of innocuous kind of injury it's nice to put that behind me and then try and kick on from november hopefully to the end of the season yeah, and in in terms of like right now, has the Ipswich medical staff given you a timeline as yet when you can get back on the pitch for training or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. So I have another week uh, where I have just a brace on just to protect my my knee or my leg. So once that's sort of complete, I can uh, I probably have two weeks just building up to like running and things like that, and off outside of training, and then uh, straight back in. So probably be three weeks to training, I think it looks like. Yeah, and then four weeks to playing. So. It's a, it's, a, it's a decent time now, but I think I can work with you. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and as you know, um, the, the World Cup is in another month from now, but it's only the Premier League and the Championship that will go on break. Is that right? Uh, and everybody yeah, else? Yeah, that's right. So mm. we'll, can, we'll continue playing games uh, in the meantime. I think we have FA Cup fixtures as well while, mm. the, while the World Cup is going on, um, which to be fair, it's one of them. It's like... You know, the break would have been nice, but at the same time, it's also good to, like, our team's, like, doing well. We're at the top, of, like, or second in the league now. It's good to sort of carry on and keep the momentum going. You know, you don't necessarily want uh, breaks all the time when your team's doing well. Uh, and for me, it's good because, you know, the moment I get back, right back into it, you know, I can get involved again. So I'm not too sad about the lack of break, although I am looking forward to watching the games of the World Cup. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, and you know when you're bearing in mind, you know that rhythm to get back into to to match sharpness with the Nations League next year and also the Gold Cup as well. It, it puts you in good stead, you know, going into the big calendar of games next year. Yeah, definitely. It was something I was disappointed in with regards to obviously when I got injured. The timing was obviously bad, especially with a new coach and new management staff coming in. And I think that my obviously aim now is just to stay fit, get as much minutes under my belt as I can. Um, and then obviously looking forward to the games obviously in March uh, and then yeah into the summer so hopefully I can stay fit and have and play some part in that that would be great yeah and that game that we had last month against Argentina did you have a chance to to watch it or just the highlights and bits I yeah I just watched the highlights I didn't have a chance to watch it I had the uh, training the next day and it was uh, um it was a it was one a.m. our time I think so it was a little bit too late because I had to get in for I think either physio I think it was but yeah I saw the highlights to be fair and uh some people had some good games man it was it was a good watch mm -hmm. yeah and as you know it's it's basically a new gaffer in charge but I'm sure you know the the pedigree that he brings as well especially from the the time he had with Iceland beating England and qualifying for the World Cup and everything like that yeah for sure for sure he has a good. Uh, he has a good record, you know, and I think that that someone coming in with that kind of, like you say, some that degree of uh, of, of pro uh, professionalism and a, a degree of how he's going to go about sort of winning games, making us a stronger team. I think it, it brings a lot, and it's something that a lot as players you want to be involved in. You know, he looks like he's he's here to to create a project, and that's something that I'm definitely interested in. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, Greg, you know, a lot of people might look at League One in a different light compared to the Championship and the Premier League. But when you look at the league, you know, you have yourself, uh, Uncle Maps is back in back in England. You know what I'm Uncle saying? Uncle Maps back doing his thing as well. They won. I think they won at the weekend. It's good to see. <laughs> yeah, you know, he, he's back in the mix. You have, you have Darren Moore, a former Jamaican international head coach of um, Sheffield Wednesday. Uh, Jamil mm. Mattis banging goals at, at Forest Green Rovers. So it's great to see that you have Jamaicans in and around, you know, the top three divisions, you know. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think the one thing that's misconstrued about League One is this big, this big, big teams in there. Uh, and like I said, a lot of talent, you know, come through there. 
know that and Mikel spent time in League One. You know, Andre was like so many people have spent time in League One, but also the, the caliber of teams, you know, like the top, I'm trying to think the top six, you've got like your Sheffield Wednesday championship side, Bolton used to be championship side, Peterborough just come down championship side, Portsmouth, again, big, big clubs, you know, and, and obviously ourselves, Ipswich, like there's teams that, uh, yeah, if you're with huge followings and huge fan bases, just probably mismanaged and probably our championship sides. And, uh, and obviously, everyone vying to get back up is probably more competitive at times. But like I said, the aim is championship. Um, and for me, anyway, being in a team that's that's trying to that's you know trying to get there and and up there, you know, challenging to be in the champ, mm -hmm. that's uh, it shows as well like how competitive the leagues are. But also, it's not it is like you say, it's nice to see the Jamaicans doing well, man. Yeah. I've seen him. It's, it's a real boy, Exeter, isn't it? Giovanni Brown. Yeah, he's, yeah, thing, yeah. Man. He's, he's got some serious goals this year. I was watching him. I was watching him, man. He's doing well. Yeah, definitely. Johnson Clark Harris, Peterborough. You know, he's oh, he's, killing it. He's killing it. Yeah, massive. and then when you look at the Premier as well, you uh, Bobby Reed doing his bits as well. And Tony he's doing so well, Bobby. He's doing very well. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's, it's nice to see, man. Especially when because a lot of these players, like you know, obviously you know him in and out, like with regards to watching the Prem and things like that. And then you know I'm just maybe from friends and friends, but when you've been away and you see you've been with a group, you've got that real feeling of like pride and happiness and proud of them when they do well, you know what I mean? And it's just, uh, yeah, it's just it's nice to see, man, for, for sure. Yeah, and I mean, you had the chance to to play with Leon Bailey as well. This is his second season at Aston Villa and, you know, he's had a lot of different changes around him, players, management, but he's, he's grafting, grafting every day and, you know, slowly but surely getting the rewards, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, I think it's nice to see because I think that coming to a different league is always difficult. You know, you have, there's a lot to get used to and especially the Premier League is like unforgiving. So to see how Leon sort of starting to settle himself, off, you know, goals, assists, you know, really settling into the team and, and doing doing what you know he does best. Uh, and I think he's starting to really enjoy it. He's starting to see that just in, I don't know, man, just in what you see on his on his social media and how in, how interactive he is with sort of the fans of the club and that's yeah man it's just uh it's it's a it's a difficult thing but he seems to be really finding his feet it's nice yeah, yeah and I mean you know you're you know at Ipswich it's a it's a two year deal and you know the the club is flying you know and everything I was just curious you know those times that you were abroad in Scotland and 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 in, obviously in Holland did ever an opportunity come your way to perhaps go to America or go to the Far East in Asia any opportunity came your way that like that. A little bit, yeah. I had a couple uh, conversations with teams in America, um, mm. and and to be fair, I haven't. Well, there was a couple of things in Australia, but I didn't actually pursue them, so to speak. I think for me, I did. I did have a dream of trying to reach the championship. You know, I think that when you kind of have that in your mind, you're like, right, well, let me let me tick off the the, the milestones, especially while I'm my age. That I am like, I can, I believe I can get there. So, and I believe that you know, once I do that, hopefully, I can look onto different things, maybe. My priorities are change. I'm not sure, but the championship for me, I really see it as something that I want to uh, want to achieve and want to get there. So I feel like the moves to Scotland, they were really, I think, to further my career, and they did, and I really enjoyed it. Same with Holland, um, and I think that you just you, you set your new goals. You know, you go right. This is what I want to do next, and uh, yeah. But once I get that, who knows? Who knows? Is it true that when you were in the academy at City, that you were a striker, or when? You... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was. <laughs> I think uh, I think pretty much everyone started off as a striker, from what I'm hearing. Not a matter of people. Yeah, I was a striker and then a left winger. And then I think I just filled in uh, centre-half for a few games. Wow. And the coach was like, all right, like, OK. Let's, you know, I know. And then, uh, yeah, I think left-back was a good medium for me. Some attacking, some defending. Um, yeah, so I think that a lot of a lot of uh, full-backs started off as failed wingers, if I'm honest. But, uh, I wouldn't say failed, but, you know. Left yeah. back, I'm happy. I'm happy there. I'm happy yeah, there. Yeah. yeah, it was meant to be. But but yeah, I mean, when you look at Jamaica now with left backs, I mean, yourself, Amar Bell, you know, Taxi, real competition, you know. It, I'm, but I'm sure, you know, the, the way that you had to start off at City with the competition for places, I'm sure you'd be prepared for the challenge at hand with Taxi and Amar, yourself, Jaden Brown and Sheffield knocking on the door. I'm sure you're ready for the challenge. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know what it is? I think that, like, I think in, when there's competition for places, it breeds the quality in everybody. You know, at the end of the day, we're, we're a squad, a team, like the team play, but the squad is there. Um, and ultimately, I think when you've got competition for places, like you do pretty much in, in most positions uh, for the reggae boys, like, I think it's it's only going to make the team better. And 
the main aim of the team is to be successful, you know, to go to competitions and, and to try and do as well as you can in them. Um, and that only comes from having a competitive squad, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you see somebody like Maps, who's in his late 30s, is that a bit of motivation for you that, you know, he can still play at a high level at, at his age and still put in consistent performances? Is that like a motivation for you as well? I'd say so, yeah, for sure. I mean, Maps is, again, someone who's, like like last year, he just went, all right, he's going to go do it in another country as well. And I think it's it's not only just, obviously, his footballing ability and knowing, okay, like he's managed to stay in the game for this long and be that professional for that long and really have a career that you, you look and you're in awe of, really. But also just have a person he is, you know, that's something that you kind of aspire to be as well. So, yeah, he's got he's got a lot of uh, attributes on and off the pitch where you think, OK, that's, that's what you'd want to embody and want to try and emulate, you know, as a player, uh, like you say, on and off the pitch. Yeah, Greg, and, you know, when you look at the quality that we have in the squad with, with the national team as well, you would you say that, you know, perhaps challenging for the Gold Cup title is something that should be on our radar, bearing in mind the talent at our disposal? Yeah, I think I would say so. You know, I think that when you look at some of the, uh, especially some of the World Cup qualifying games, you look at, like, how, you know, close we were to, to, to beating these sides and to, and, and to challenge. I don't think there was many games where you look and say we weren't in the game at all and we mm -hmm. couldn't have come away with the points you know especially even in the last time in the Gold Cup losing to winners like I think it's it's something we should definitely aspire to do to do well and to win the competition you know especially with the quality we have there's no reason why not um, and I think we've just come up a little bit short but if we can get ourselves together there's, there's absolutely nothing to say we can't yeah, <clears throat> definitely. And in terms of, you know, the, the experiences that you've had so far, you know, representing Jamaica, it, it might not be a lot of appearances, but I'm sure you've relished every mo moment, every minute you, that you've played for Jamaica. Yeah, for sure, man. It's just, uh, yeah, any any minute I got on a pitch, it meant a lot. And I think that, you know, for me, I think that I, when I went out there the first couple of times, it was just to be in part of it was massive. And then when you do get your chance, all you want to do is just take it and do as well as possible. Uh, and I think, yeah, for me, it was it was just an honor every time, you know. And I think, yeah, I just think it was it was it was a big deal. And uh, and the main thing I wanted to do is do as well as possible, you know. And I think that contributing to the team, um, every time I've been on the field, I've really really enjoyed. And I just want to do that and do it more. And yeah, it's just it's a, it's a good it's a good feeling, but also being part of the side, like I say, when there's togetherness like that, it's uh it really makes makes you it gives you that motivation to 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 achieve something as a team. And that's what we want to do. And uh, being part of it is just massive, you know. Hmm. Yeah, Greg, I mean, you're raised raised in Manchester, the second reggae boy after Paul Hall, uh, who was born in Manchester to play for the reggae boys. Uh, you can say better than than anyone that, that you, when you go in Manchester, there's a massive, massive Jamaican community within Shaw, alongside Moss Side, all over. So you you just know for a fact that, you know, the, the talents at our disposal especially in Manchester, it's massive in terms of the Jamaican community and also players that are growing as well and developing in that area. Yeah, for sure, man. For sure. I mean, a lot of the players, and it's a, it's a positive thing that you have such a, like, a widespread network of, of teams as well because you have a lot of the players who are getting picked up, getting the opportunities, you know, and, and that's I think that's the main thing. I think that when you really think about the players who've come through in the last sort of couple of years, they've all found themselves in professional football, you know, and I think that that's, that's kind of a big, it makes a big difference because when you're talking about coming into a, 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 an environment like the Reggae Boys, when you've been playing at a championship level, you know, I think that we all find that when you've been playing at the championship level, the Prem level, coming into the games, it, it really helps because you're, you're up to speed or you're, or you're improving the whole time and you're learning a lot. So the more that you do it, the more you go, you know, it's definitely something that you really... Uh, you can really improve so with regards to the boys that are coming up through it yeah. you know you've still got the people like maps around it and you can come into the environment learn off people like him and then you know obviously go back and use it yourself and just start to improve as a player um but when you've got as much of the talent pool to pick from with all the with all the you know with all like you're only going to get like the you know the best players and that's what I'm saying it's, it's competitive but at the same time it breeds such a quality in the squad um, so, yeah, having a bigger pool is always a positive, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, the time that you had playing in Manchester, uh, you know, trial at United and actually being at City, do you, do you still keep contact with anyone that you used to play with or perhaps the backroom staff or anything like that? Do you still keep in contact with anyone from either club? 
I do, to be fair. I actually, so obviously I played with Devante. I played with Devante twice. I played with Devante Cole at City oh. and then I played with him at Barnes, uh, not Barnsley, at Bradford. He's at, he's at Barnsley now. Yeah. Um, and I still chat with him. Uh, George, like George Evans, he's at, um, he's at Millwall now. Jordi Hawula, he's up, up north. He's in Scotland at the moment, Ross County. But yeah, quite a few of the boys, to be fair. Because um, we had we had a quite a good group at City, even though it was a little bit, you know, with a lot of the foreign boys coming in, we got a little bit split. It was um, it was it's still nice to keep in contact with a lot of the boys that were still were there at the time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, as you said, you know earlier that you know not many players that were born in England got opportunities in the first team back then. I was just curious that one player that had his chance, uh, Michael Johnson. Did you ever get a chance to train with him during your time at City, or he's a bit older than you? He was so Michael Johnson. He um. He was a little bit older, but by the time I trained with him, he kind of let himself go, if I'm honest. So uh, he was uh, he kind of got his big break and he did really well, but then he kind of lost. I think he lost all his motivation. Um, so I actually didn't get... But I got a chance to train with um, Nader Manua, Michael Richards, you know, people like that. And obviously a lot of the first teamers when we were there, but from the young boys, um, mo yeah, mostly uh, Nadam and, uh, and Meeks, which was good. You know, that's a good experience because you almost see, okay, this is what you can achieve if, you know, if you get the opportunity. So you have to just keep going and hope you get the opportunity, you know. Yeah. And in terms of that, you know, new ownership group, did they have a chance to to mingle with you or perhaps the academy lads as well, just to get to know you guys and just invite you to functions and stuff like that? Um, But what, back with the first team? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. to, to be fair, a lot of them were quite welcoming. Like a lot of, them, especially some of the some of the English lads. Like I remember Hearty was good. Uh, I still chat to Les Scott. To be fair, mm -hmm. Julian, I still chat with him, which is really good. And um, De Jong was good, and Meeks were good. So it was like quite a good core group that would be quite inviting. I know a few of the other boys. Jordy was quite close with Colatore at the time. Um, Evo was quite close with Lampard, and Lampard actually took him to Derby when he uh, when he got the opportunity. So it actually worked out pretty well for Evo in that respect. But yeah, I think a lot of the, some of the some of the first team boys were very welcoming and it was a good environment when I was there. Obviously I have no idea how it how it is now or how it differs. But it was it was I think that being in a first team environment, sort of regardless of where it is, is like a is a big is a big uh is a big help, you know. Yeah. And finally, Greg, because, you know, this has been brilliant. How did you, you know, hide for over a decade, you know, that, that you were actually a red in a blue shirt, you know? <laughs> Honestly, I just kept it very quiet. You know, I actually got tickets to like some derby games and just kind of just kept myself to myself. You know what I mean? Because it was a bit reckless back then. Yeah, um, yeah no, nah, we didn't tell nobody. There's a few of us, by the way, just me. But yeah, we didn't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have you sat in the stretch for the end? Oh man, that's I have to be fair, yeah. But like, I ain't telling no one from City like you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I know you like a red as well, innit? So, yeah, you know yeah. What I mean, a bit of you bouncing, yeah, yeah, it's massive, yeah. It's like every five minutes you're jumping and singing and stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's good, class. man. It's good, it's class, yeah. Manchester's great, man. Always, always wonderful. But look, Greg, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much for talking to me. All the best in terms of the recovery, uh, from injury. And um, we'll be in touch if I'm down south, uh, in England, I'll definitely hit you up. Yeah, for sure, man. Let me know.